we come this day expecting God to come. And God does. God surprises us by coming and sharing his good news with us, by giving us healing and giving us life. But most of all, he comes as he gives us his son. And so may we open our lives to receive that and trust it and live it with joy. In the name of Jesus, amen. A couple of announcements to make. First of all, uh, if you... Uh, we will have our meals again this week, so uh, do sign up and come by, and you can pick it up on, on Wednesday nights. Uh, those have been very good. Uh, and also, the church council will meet on Tuesday night, and tomorrow morning, the, the men will meet at, uh, at 645. I, I get up. I'm not an early, early riser, but I make that, and it's a good thing I do because I enjoy it. It's, it's a good time together, so I hope that uh, uh, some of you more will join us at this time. But we're here because we're called by God. Let us rejoice and enjoy that. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let us pray. Come, Lord Jesus. Come into the darkness that we have in our hearts and put your light, your love, your forgiveness. Come, Lord Jesus. Come in this day and touch our lives that we may realize that we are important in your kingdom building and help us to build kingdom, your kingdom in all we do. Come, Lord Jesus. We pray this day for the world. We thank you for doctors who have worked and, and research scientists who have worked to, to help us eliminate this COVID virus. We thank you for their work in the past and their work in the future. We thank you for that work that we may be a people who are healed and give our lives, give life to others. Father, we thank you for those who are part of the rescue efforts, those who drive ambulances, those who work in hospitals and emergency rooms, and those who care for us and take risks during this period to make life better. Well, Father, we thank you for their lives and what they do for us. And we hold before you sacred names of those who have died as they have sought to eliminate this COVID virus. And we remember also those who have died with this disease. Father, bring us peace and help us know that you're with us. And as we worship this day together, may we be your instruments of peace and love and joy. In the name of Jesus who taught us to pray saying, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand together to share the Apostles' Creed. There are people all around the world today who are sharing this in hundreds of languages, who are sharing this in, in small churches, in large cathedrals, but all affirming that who we are, that you're, we're your people. Let us share together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven and to the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. So very happy to have the ensemble's assistance today uh, with our hymn focus, as well as our call to worship just a moment ago. Uh, leading into uh, the hymn focus period, we have Bar Barbara Thomas with us, and she is going to give us some background information on the hymn, I Surrender All. Good morning. Good morning. Someone once said, only in the Christian life does surrender bring victory. History has recorded countless examples of very unhappy people who received no relief from their suffering until they surrendered to God's calling. Talented artist and art instructor, Judson Vandeventer, also enjoyed and excelled in Christian ministry through his Methodist Episcopal Church in Sharon, Pennsylvania. Often he wondered whether ministry was his true calling, but his expanding art successes and recognition on a national level caused him to waver five years before surrendering to God's leadership into full-time evangelistic preaching. The text the ensemble sings today is authored by Judson Vandeventer, written as he recalled the day he surrendered his life to Christ and dedicated himself completely to God's service.
Thank you, choir. It's really good to have you all back together, the ensemble. Let's see here. All right. Don't worry, I knocked that over one time completely, so don't worry. <laughs> uh, a couple of words of uh, explanation. You'll notice that the choir has on uh, masks that, uh, I, if I wanted to insult them, I could call them feeding masks, but I, I, w I won't insult them by calling them that. But, but these are special masks that are made. Uh, singer's masks is what they are, exactly. They're not feeder's masks, they're singer's masks. Uh, what, what happened was, uh, as we've learned about this COVID virus, we realize it's a, it's a viral thing. It goes out of the mouth. And, and so what, what happens is that uh, uh, we know that when you talk, it's about six feet. Probably preachers are about 25 feet, I'm not sure. But, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but singing is about 15 feet. So, uh, you know, for a long time we didn't sing. So we, uh, but, but the choir was able to... Uh, acquire these masks. They bought one that somebody made somewhere and they tore it apart and they, they made, uh, and they, so they used that design to, to make new ones. So uh, uh, it's, it's really a, a neat mask that they made and it's, it, it protects us and we, we appreciate that very much. Uh, yeah. Full disclosure, uh, Pamela Ray. Pamela made those. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they were about $25 a piece and we said, uh-uh. But uh, so she took them apart and Made them about eight dollars, about three dollars a piece, three or four dollars a piece. So uh, she, we can't beat that. Of course, we uh, don't know about copyrights, but we didn't raise that question at all. Uh, I want to invite you to stand for the scripture as we we stand to to hear God's word for our lives. And today is a, kind of a strange word. Please stand. The scripture today is from the Gospel of John. We've been in Mark a good bit. Uh, but today is the cleansing of the temple. Now, this appears in all four Gospels. Uh, but in the synoptics, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it is at the very end as if to say that this is, the, uh, this is what caused Jesus to be uh, arrested. Uh, John puts it at the very beginning as if to say, this is what Jesus is doing. He's coming in and disrupting all of life and calling for a new way, a new way of looking. Now, uh, you say, well... Which one's right? I don't know. One of the things you've got to understand about ancient historians is they were not as concerned about getting the facts right in, in sequence. They were about passing the message across. So this is John's message that everything is turned upside down with Jesus, not just the tables. Hear, hear the word from uh, the second chapter of John, starting with the 13th verse. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Now, now all this was for sacrifice. And what happens if you, you came from a long way away, you, you needed to, to buy the uh, sheep or, or, or the cattle, or can you imagine walking with two doves on your shoulder all the way down? Uh, or, and the money you used was, there's so much kind of different kind of change around, and you had to have temple money because anything with the uh, with, with the emperor's uh, picture on it could not be turned in. It was, it was considered profane and, and could not go into the temple. So, so there were money changes for, for that reason. Of course, they, they made a lot of money in it too. But uh, he, making, a whip of, of, uh, of, uh, making a whip of cords, he drove, Jesus drove uh, all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He poured out the cha uh, coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told them who were selling the doves, take these out of here. Make sure, uh, stop making my father's house a marketplace. One, one kind of word about that is uh, uh, with, with, he did not uh, throw out the, uh, uh, the, the dove, those who had doves or, or pigeons for sale. Uh, a couple of reasons. Number one, if you did that, they'd fly away. Uh, but, but the second thing was, uh, remember when Jesus was baptized we dedicated, they do two turtle doves. This is for the very poorest of the poor. So, so he, he turned over their tables and he, he told those who, who sell doves to take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Hear those words. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples would remember that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, 
What sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is God's word for our lives. Thanks be to God. Be seated. The reason that I, I, I sit on the stool like this is that God did not uh, did not give me a back that would last forever. And so I've, in, in my 70s now, my, my spine kind of, uh, uh, it, 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 it's not as good as it was. Uh, I have a, a, a slip disc. If I didn't have this, I could only preach about 10 minutes. Now, don't say amen, okay? <laughs> no, uh, uh, no, it's, it, it, the two things about it, number one, so I can, I can preach comfortably, but the second thing is, uh, I know that I I, I slow down when I'm on on the uh, when I sit on a stool when I teach like this. Uh, teachers found that in their in their lives, they, they sit on a stool that they they, they uh, can go a lot longer and they they will do it a lot slower so the kids can understand them. So uh, so I, I mean, I'm here for that reason. Uh, but uh, also, uh, let me tell you experience I had in my life. I, I went to work with a fellow named Don Wardlog. Uh, uh, professor of preaching in, 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 in Lutheran Seminary in, 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 in Chicago. And, and he had us, that was back in the old days when we had those CD, those VD, VDDs, uh, you know, where you put it in and kind of run it. Well, it, we all brought one of our sermons, so he, he took mine and put it in and, and started it. And he says, let's go a little bit faster and see how this sounds. Well, do you remember those old birds that kind of go up and down in water like this? That's what it looked like. And uh, a friend of mine had said to me, he says, uh, when you go into that room, because he had done the same thing, he says, uh, uh, park your ego at the door, check your ego at the door. Well, the problem was when I came back out, my ego wasn't there. It, it, <laughs> it, it took me a while, and, and I realized that really my way of preaching is not as some folks who are very good at it, who, who read from a manuscript, uh, that I'm more of a storyteller. And my way of preaching needs to be just, uh, just straight off like this before us. So uh, that's why I, I do the things I do. Uh, but the thing about it, I, I, I tell you that just to remind you that sometimes your failures are the best thing that ever happened to you. Uh, and and uh, for me, this was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And my wife will still come and listen to me because of that, I think, in some ways. She see, there she is. Where is she at? Uh, I, I, I don't blame her. <laughs> there she is right back there with the white coat on. But uh, by the way, it's her birthday tomorrow, so you can wish her happy birthday when you leave here. Uh, for, for, for 40 days now, she's older than I am. So uh, I, 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 she hates it, but I, I tell her that anyway. But, but anyway, the scripture that I read this morning is, is not one of my favorite scriptures. Uh, I don't like to, to, to read this because, there's, particularly in this context where we are today, in, in, in the context of having the, the, the riots that we've had and uh, uh, the riot in Washington, uh, uh, all of a sudden to, to find Jesus in the middle of a riot, which this is in some ways, is, is not very comfortable. Plus that, uh, uh, the fact that he, he drove the animals out uh, I, I always feel like I need to make a disclaimer. The disclaimer is that no animals were hurt in the making of the scripture. The, the, this was, uh, you know, it was, a, 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 it was just a, a cloth or le leather that he uses as the farmer might use to, to drive his, his animals into the barn at night. Uh, this is just a, it was not like the, the whip that was used on Jesus later on, which was a, was a leather strip, yes, 
but it had in, embedded in there glass and metal where it tore his back. This was just getting the sheep and cattle out of that kind of, kind of stuff. So, so, so this is a, these are just kind of, uh, this was something that everybody would accept. And until a few years ago, we might have thought the same thing. But the, the thing about it was that what was kind of upsetting about this to Jesus was the way that the Jews understood the temple. Now, now the temple, if you will picture it, is about five acres big. I don't know what five acres is in this area, but, but five acres, uh, and in the middle of it was the temple. Now, on, on either end was, uh, was the administrative offices for the, for, the, for the chief priest. But here in the middle, what was the temple? There were five areas in that area. Starting with that outside where, where the money changers and the uh, sellers of sheep probably were was, was the outer court. There would be the area where uh, uh, anybody could go, Gentiles, Jews, anybody could go. And that, that's where they sold uh, this uh, sheep and, and changed the coins and things like that. The next area in is the area of the women. Now, they were kind of sexist. Women could only go in so far, and this was where they could go. In fact, if you go to Jerusalem today at, at the Wailing Wall, you'll find a park for men over here and a park for women over here. And, and Americans, we just don't like that too much because we, we, we like to, I mean, I don't have you all sit male and females. You're all together. A, a, anyway, that, there, there was an area for the women. Then there was the area for the ordinary man, people like Joseph's father, people coming down, down from Nazareth, but then there was an area inside that next to it was for the priest. And only the priest could go. So you got outsiders, the, the, the Gentile area, which anybody could go, the women's area, again, anybody but the Gentiles, and then the area for the men. And then you have on the inside the Holy of Holies. And their thinking was this is where God dwells. And it was such a holy place that the only person that would go into it was one priest a year that was selected by lottery, and they'd put a rope around his foot and let him go in to clean it, because if he fainted, they didn't, nobody could go in and get him. They had to just drag him out. Uh, remember the story about John's father when he was a, 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 the, a, head, a head priest? And, and I mean, he, he was a priest who went in and did that. He fainted. I mean, he didn't faint, but he, he, he was dumb. He, he could not speak because of that astonishing event. So, so you, you see that temple was a holy of the holies, and Jesus' concern was, this is my Father's house. And we know that in, I and the Father are one, says Jesus. And, and then in his Father's house, which that whole temple area was called the, the temple, it was called the temple area, it, there, there they were selling these things. And Jesus was indignant. And we don't blame him, do we? Because in this very holy area, they were selling his things, the, the, the things and making his father's house a marketplace. And so he's very angry. Or if not angry, it may not be the right word. He, uh, Paul puts it this way. He says, uh, be angry, but do not sin. And that's what Jesus did. He turned things over and he, he, he ran things out. But, but, but he, he did not sin. But, but you see, that, that was a, a, a holy place. Now, now, we know the history of that a little bit. Later on, when Jesus was crucified and when he died, the scriptures tell us that the, the, the curtain which stands between where the priests were and where the, where the Holy of Holies was, was torn from top to bottom. That meant that suddenly God was open to everybody all the way back down. That, that, that it, was, it was now an open place that, that God... And that's the way we understand God. God is not just limited to those who are priests or the holy of holy or, or just for the men, but God is for everybody. Suddenly we have a different look about where God is. But that temple was kind of a, a holy of holies. It was a place that was, was holy. But, but after that, what happened with the, with the Christian faith and the Jewish faith, because later on the temple was destroyed completely by the Romans, and so suddenly we began to understand that God was as much in our hearts as he was there in the temple. 
there was that those things that were between us and God were torn apart, and God is right with us. God's right with us in Jesus Christ, and so so that that's that, that's where we are right there. Is that God is right there, is right with us. Now today, we we know there are holy places. Sometimes there there are churches and buildings. Uh, you know, this is a holy place, and uh, for a lot of you who had marriages here or or baptisms here or or buried your loved ones from this place. And by the way, I hope that we get back to that whenever we get through with this COVID thing. But, but, but this is a very sacred place. And, and we have the symbols around us to make this sacred. There in your windows there, you, you have the symbols. And, and back here behind me, we have the, the altar. And we have, uh, underneath it, I bet it says, in, his, in remembrance of him. We have the candles, of the two sides of Jesus, the, the divine side, the holy side. We have the cross we have the dove coming down. We, we, have, we, have the, uh, the, we, we have the communion on the table because that says to us that Jesus comes to us. Jesus comes into our lives, and, and he breaks his body for us. He sp- spills his blood for us. So, 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 so we have holy places. There's a word that the Scottish use that I love. It's called thin places. And we, we've begun to use it in our vocabulary as well. But a thin place is that place where uh, the, the distance between you and God is, is very thin. Uh, you probably experience that sometimes where you, where you feel the very presence of God. Or, or you kind of feel God running by you, kind of like a dove flying away. And that is a, that's God's presence with you. That's God's presence in your life. So see, God is, is there with us. Uh, no longer are, was he bound to the temple where, where he was just there in the Holy of Holies, but God is all over the place. They knew that then, but, but we know it even more today. So, so we understand that uh, how Jesus could have felt that day uh, about that. But, but what happens, I thought, as I began, began to think about this and to to, to ponder where to go with this sermon, I realize that when we come to worship, there are two things that happen. Uh, one is inward, and the other is outward. As we come here, when we're open to it, and sometimes we're not, and I'm not sometimes, but when we're open to it, God comes to us in a very special way. My, my, my hope with the sermon is that, that somehow or another, as I preach, I can reveal God to you, that you can be surprised by how God comes into your life. One of the things about that that we need to understand is that uh, uh, we, we, we feel God come into our lives, and uh, I'm not so sure we want that sometimes. Remember when Isaiah was in the temple and Suddenly he felt the presence of God and, and the angels and the seraphim and all that was above him. Remember what happened? He fell down and he said, I am an unholy man among an unholy people. Woe is me. Not just uh, sorry for me, but, but woe is me. And we sometimes ourselves know that. We know that we are sinners. That, that we have failed. But, but let me tell you this. You're in good company. You, you see, the saints of the, of the world, they know better than anybody else their own sins. They know where they've gone, they know where they've gone wrong. And, and in their, their sense of being able to reach God, they help us see where we sometimes fall apart ourselves and don't reach God. You see, that's what, uh, we're coming here because, uh, not because we're perfect, but because we are broken. This is a hospital for us, as we've heard earlier. It's a hospital for us as, as God comes in and gives us healing here. But we come here not because we're well, but we come here because we're sick. Somebody asked me the other day, well, do you enjoy working in church? And I said to him, he says, well, 
and I've thought of this all, all, all the, a lot of times through the years, is that I love the folks who know they're sinners. But there are folks who come to church who think they're not sinners. And they're hard to live with. And I think we know that ourselves, don't we? Uh, we, we know, and, and we know also those times when we, we see somebody else and think of them a sinner and we don't think of ourselves. But you see, that's what it means to come to church, is to come into, that, uh, into this place and, and not just be awed and, and feel touched by God. But, but when we're touched by God, we, we, we a lot of times know how, how, how sick we are, how much of a sinner we are. I, uh, but the other part of that is in knowing that that's where God can reach us and touch us and give us life and God can give us healing. I have a, 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 a shopping bag that I, I use when I go buy groceries sometimes and I show it to folks that they don't, they don't think too much of it, as much about it as I do, but it says, uh, uh, God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. You know, that's, that's the reality of it is that, that God loves you and you, you can try all you want to, but God's going to still love you. We do need to respond to that. But God does love us. So, so there is that movement in the church, in the sanctuary, and into our prayer lives of, of going inward, of knowing what we are to do and to be. And, and, and so it, that temple was, was for, for that. But then there is the other part. There's the other part of being thrust outward. We kind of uh, pull inward and then we go outward. Well, you see, if we, we come here and we are not changed, if we do not seek to change ourselves, we've wasted our time. Because what happens is that, that God sends us out. God sends us out as his ministers from this place. There was a, a convention speaker for preachers one time who was uh, talking to him, and he said, uh, let me ask you this. How many of you, uh, when you have new officers in the church, do you, do you bring them up front and do you dedicate them and commission them? And everybody raised their hand and says, well, if your youth or your adults are going on a mission trip, do you bring them to the front of the church and commission them and, and send them out with the church's grace? And everybody says, yeah, yeah. He says, well, uh, now this is time of year, about this time of year, he says, uh, uh, your public accountants and your, uh, uh, they are fixing to enter into tax season. Do you bring them forward to, to bless them and commission them to be uh, accountants for, uh, in, in, in the name of Jesus? And nobody raised their hand. His point was that, that, that we don't just commission folks to, to come to church. I mean, to just to do things for the church. But we commission folks to go out into the world. To be uh, healers of, uh, and, and to, to heal with our words and, and with our compassion. To, to share joy, to, to share hope. We're, we're really ministers of hope and joy and life. Uh, we've been commissioned by Jesus for that. That's why we go out from the church. Maybe the next time you go to the pig or to the Publix, know that you are commissioned by God. Those folks who are stocking the shelves, those folks who are uh, cashiers and kind of in some ways having a little danger in lives because of all of us going in, sometimes folks not caring, uh, that you have a chance to be a, a, a missionary, a minister of grace and forgiveness and life. Uh, next time you go in, try to uh, just speak to, uh, uh, to those who are there. Uh, just speak a friendly word or, 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 if you can, a teasing word that does not come across as, as condemnation. To share some joy. I, I usually ask those folks if you, when I get money back from them if I can have ten more dollars. <laughs> and they laugh because they know that it's foolish, that it can't do that. But that kind of breaks down the barrier, and, and I can speak to them some. One of these days, maybe somebody will give me that $10. I don't, I don't think so, though. But, but, but you, you understand what's going on there, is it, that I see myself, as I do those things, to be a minister of grace, a minister of joy. And I invite you to do the same thing. I, I, I remember one time I was on the telephone, and I, uh, somebody had messed me up in terms of a 
some kind of package I ordered. So I, I was really giving the, the folks on the end of the phone down the road. And then all of a sudden I said, I apologize. I said, I apologize. I, I all of a sudden I realized, you didn't have anything to do with that. You, you just here to take my gruff. And I said, I'm sorry. Uh, and we laughed for a minute. And she says, yeah, there's a lot of that I get. Uh, and then, uh, but, but I was able to change from a, a minister of evil to a minister of, of, of grace. I don't point myself out that much because there's a lot of times I don't do it. You know, a lot of times I, I fail to do it. And, uh, but, but uh, you know, you were, you were sent out from God not just to be a nice person, but to be a minister of joy and grace and hope. So that's where we are. So how does that deal with the scripture? Well, we, we have our own holy place we come to. And here we hear God's word. And we hear God's forgiveness. Go you into all the world and, and hear my word of grace and then share, preach the gospel. Preach it a lot of times without words or with just kind words. But we, we share those things. And so what happens is as we come here, just like Jesus went into the temple and disrupted things and turned things upside down, he comes into our lives and he disrupts things. He turns things upside down and shares his salvation with the world. May we cooperate that. Cooperate with that in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today we come to this very beautiful time where we share the Lord's Supper. And, and, and we remember. Remember that Jesus met with his disciples there in the upper room the night before he was to be betrayed. And, and remember, the disciples were not the best in the world at that time. There were a couple of them arguing about who would be oh, sit on his right and who would sit on his left. Uh, there were those that were there, who would, who, who, one who would de de betray him. Peter would deny him. The rest of the disciples would run away. But still Jesus brought these sinners together, called disciples. And he took the bread and he, he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and he shared it with him and says, Drink ye all of this. This is my blood that is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so we take this, know that Jesus pours out his blood for us, we sinners who are trying to do better. He pours it out for us and gives us life. COVID has kept us from doing what we want to do, which is come to this altar and, and receive the bread and the cup or the, or, or the chalice, whichever we happen to choose that day. But, but, so, but we still want to do this and remember that. So we do it the, the I don't know, I said, I don't say it's a god-awful way. Uh, these little cups with the bread and the juice there uh, but, but still, we can, we can imagine in this, as we do this, that, that we are here sharing the bread and the cup and making all the difference. Now, I, I know some of you have trouble with arthritis, and I know I've, I've got some too, and unfortunately, it's this finger right here. But, but uh, so this is where we can be a community. If you can't open yours, don't be prideful. Punch somebody next to you and say, here, open this for me. Because this is a community. And, and though we couldn't share this as a community, we can share this as a community. So I invite you to come. Uh, let me put on my mask. And let me see. Let me come down here. Bring my hand.
us pray. God, take these elements. Help them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world redeemed. Thank you for this gift that surprises us. In the name of Christ, amen. You can come forward, and if you wish, you can kneel at the altar and, and take apart the cup, or else you can go back and sit where you are. Uh, but, but again, if you have trouble, punch somebody next to you. Don't punch them too hard, but just punch them a little bit and say, help me, and they'll understand. But, so I, I invite you to come to take these elements. You have come inward and you've received the grace and love of God, the unexpected, the joyful forgiveness. Now you're sent forth to share that with everybody you see in the world. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray.
Amen. Go in peace and joy. Amen.